You're listening to the Inbound Logistics Podcast with a special look at our video podcast series. Welcome to the Inbound Logistics video podcast series presented by Inbound Logistics Magazine and Zometry. Today, we will focus on the impact of ongoing disruptions across supply chain and manufacturing sectors and how businesses adapt and evolve to meet those challenges. Joining us are Mike Short, President of Global Forwarding at CH Robinson and Jeff Ackle, CEO of Sigma Thermal. And here is our host, Amy Roach. Thanks, Jeff. Mike, uh, Jeff, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for having me as well. Absolutely. Excited to jump in and talk about all things disruption. Uh, but before we get there, if you would, Mike, I'll start with you, but each just give us a brief overview uh, of your company and your role there uh, at the firm. Sure. Thank you. Uh, so CH Robinson's one of the uh, world's largest uh, logistics companies. Um, we uh, work with companies around the world. Uh, we work with them to reimagine their supply chains, advance freight technology, and solve any of their logistics needs. So we do ocean, we do air, uh, we do rail, we do truck transportation, customs, and, and much more globally. Uh, and in North America, we're the largest freight broker, uh, truck freight broker. And uh, I'm the president of Global Forwarding uh, of C.H. Robinson, and uh, I have the honor of leading a team across the globe and I've been in the industry for about 27 years. Great. Okay, Jeff, tell us a little bit uh, about Sigma Thermal. Yeah, sure thing. So Sigma Thermal designs and manufactures uh, large industrial heating equipment. So uh, think like refineries, chemical plants, um, all different types of manufacturing, uh, power plants. Um, we uh, uh, design and manufacture and provide that equipment. We also provide field services and spare parts for that equipment. So we're uh, we're active, um, very active in North America, South America. We also have an office in the Middle East that uh, supports uh, uh, a lot of our Middle East business as well as our business in the Caspian region, uh, a little bit in India and Pakistan as well. Um, so we're uh, we're not we're not quite on every continent, but pretty close. Great. Well, I'm excited to have the uh, two different perspectives from the manufacturing side, from the supply chain side, and lots of great synergy. Uh, again, our theme is disruption. And, you know, unfortunately, disruption is kind of the new norm. Uh, it's take your pick. We have, you know, um, port strikes, Red Sea disruption, drought in the Panama Canal, uh, wars, extreme weather. We have uh, election coming up that you know has potential for disruption. So again, it's it's kind of the new norm, and I'm anxious to hear from both of you. Uh, Mike, we'll start with you again. You know, what would you say are the primary disruptions impacting global forwarding? Uh, and then Jeff, for you, you know, the primary uh, disruptions right now that you're dealing with in the manufacturing sector and specific to thermal. So Mike, if you wanna if you wanna start, that'd be great. Sure. Thanks. So. Um... The one, one thing is that uh, people don't think about is is looking at, we have the luxury of looking at uh, the full picture of a disruption and how that can cascade down uh, your supply chain. So something that may happen halfway across the world can really affect your supply chain, even if you're not involved in that. Um, so all the events, the events that you mentioned uh, are, are definitely on our mind. Uh, I would add to that supply chain shifts uh, the geopolitical environment, uh, they definitely play a role uh, in impacting the market and the balance of supply chain and demand. Um, you know, it's, it's, I've seen a lot of disruption. It does seem inevitable that there is going to be disruption every year. It is coming fast and furious. Uh, the, the make, what makes it significant uh, difference for shippers when disruption happens is being able to look across their ent entire supply chain. So whether that disruption is a, is a drought in the Panama Canal or uh, labor disputes, you need to have that flexibility 
uh, an insight into what changes you can make inland at the port or in the ocean and air is critical. So as an example, recently the U.S. port strikes that were all over the news uh, that shut down the U.S. East Coast. Granted, uh, thankfully it didn't last very long, uh, although it may not be over since it, it, it is delayed until uh, January. But, uh, you know, we work with our customers to make sure that we're looking at their entire supply chain to look for solutions. And we look beyond um, just their supply chain and we look at the data and that data tells a story in which we can actually go after uh, being predictive in avoiding some of those uh, disruptions. Um, an example of how we could do that is we had a customer that was um, had freight leaving out of the East Coast and one of the carriers actually uh, canceled the sailing out of that out of that port. And we then took that container, railed it across to the West Coast and were able to get it out. And uh, those are the types of things that we do to make sure that uh, we're looking at the entire picture uh, when we bring in solutions. Okay, great. Yeah, I think that entire picture uh, aspect is is really key. Uh, Jeff, can you talk a little bit about how that applies on your side? Yeah, I mean, we are um, we are we are right in the middle of, of exactly what Mike's talking about. Um, uh, we actually use CH Robinson; they're one of our our providers. And um, you know, going back uh, obviously to the pandemic when we had some substantial supply chain disruption, um, to um, you know, I think I, I don't think people were as concerned about the port strike as they they, they should have been um, from a supply chain disruption perspective that had the potential to be um, very significant. And um, yeah, I mean, we we see it uh, show up in our projects and and to, with our customers if we can't get our products. Um, or our components landed, if, if we can't get our materials landed and in our hands, we can't build anything. Um, you know, there, there's even, you know, beyond port disruptions, we had um, fairly recently, our uh, insurance carrier canceled our uh, our policy to cover uh, freight through the Red Sea. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, we have an office in the Middle East and we build equipment over there as well. And that's causing us to have to you know, look for different insurance solutions for um, the freight that was going through that area or find different ways to, to get that equipment to, um, in and around the, basically the south of Africa to, to, to get it to where we need it to go. And yeah, those are significant disruptions. And, you know, if you, you want to add to that, you mentioned the election, um, you know, uh, tariffs uh, certainly have impact. Um, you know, there's a, a whole world of, um, <laughs> there's a whole world of, of TikTok that has very uh, just recently become very engaged in tariffs, which I find pretty funny. Um, but but for sure, those those have a significant impact on our pricing to our customers and managing that and the timing of when that comes in and how you know if and how we can pass that to our customers um, is is also very disruptive to to our team and trying to execute our projects. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what unifies all of these different things is that uh, idea of uncertainty. So, you know, that is obviously going to factor into all of these different uh, disruptions. You know, there's an uncertainty around what will happen, when will they happen, will they happen? So I guess uh, the next sort of segue question is, how do you kind of from a high level try the best to, you know, to mitigate the impact of these disruptions? I'll take that. So, uh, well, specifically with CH Robinson, we have a flexible operating uh, model. We were asset light. So in our business model, it's set up to uh, help alleviate negative impacts during some of these disruptions. Uh, so by being flexible, we can use our arsenal of different services and products to be able to combat some of these things that uh, come along uh, either unexpected uh, or uh, we take the data within our, our um within our, our uh, business to be able to predict some of the things that can happen. And then we take that data and we see how we're able to uh, solve some of these uh, disruptions uh, with the least amount of impact uh, on our customers. And um, that's really one of the keys is just, we know there's going to be disruption. It's all about making sure that those disruptions have the least amount of impact. Uh, to our customers. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think for us, it's it's um, it's really about planning for disruption. Uh, I mean, I, I think as you you said earlier, it, it's it's kind of like the new norm. And um, if if you're not planning to be disrupted, then then you're you're going to fail. Um, so to, to give you you know maybe just like a, a, a quick example, when we're looking at supply chain, if if I you know buy steel materials, whether it be pipe or plate or um, any kind of raw materials like that, um, you know if we are proactively seeking to expand our supply chain and in some cases looking to shorten that supply chain. You know, if we're traditionally buying those materials from Eastern Europe or Southeast Asia, you know, we may be looking to Mexico um, and and trying to, you know, try and take some of that risk out of the supply chain, um, minimize the impact. You know, the other thing we have to do, which is, you know, it, it's a bit unfortunate, but it is the reality is we have to communicate that with our customers. You know, if, if we cannot guarantee certainty um, or if we can't be guaranteed certainty, then we can't guarantee certainty. And um, that means that we have to, to commercially bake that into, um, you know, our contracts and, and how we do our business um, because the, the, the world is a more uncertain place and that, you know, ultimately trickles all the way down to the consumer. So, so planning for disruption is one thing. We also need to uh, consider the leadership component of it. So I'd love to hear from both of you on your leadership perspective and how you lead through disruptions. Have you had to adjust your leadership style or you know, do you have a, an overarching philosophy of how to keep the organization going through uh, hard times and disruptions? I, I think the, the first thing that comes to my mind is regards to being in the, in these situations where you're, you're, there is disruption is being agile. Uh, I believe that being regimented and, and having a stiff structure does not allow you to react uh, to the things that you need to react to. You have to think outside the box. Uh, there are things that have happened, such as the pandemic, such as the Suez Canal, uh, that we've never anticipated or had uh, previously, and we need to react differently than we ever have. Not, we, we work with over 90,000 different customers. Within those 90,000 customers, there's no one supply chain that is exactly the same. So you have to react to those globally. We have boots on the, crown, on the ground around the world, and those people need to react differently based upon uh, the nuances within their own market within the, their customers and within the uh, providers that we work with today. So it's just being agile, um, thinking outside the box and making sure uh, that we put our customers first. Great. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I would I would offer a, a you know, similar insight, um, you know, for us um, and, and for me personally, I just I, I kind of like to think about it as as you need to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Um, you need to be planning for things to not go well at all times. And as long as that is, you know, part of your planning, then it, 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 it does become, you know, a, a little bit more manageable um, instead of, you know, being surprised every time that something, something doesn't work out exactly the way you planned. And, uh, you know, whether that's pre-planning by, you know, further developing your, your supply chain and building options for yourself on how you might be able to, uh, source something or secure something, um, or whether that's just, um, you know, planning for, for your day to, to involve some amount of, um, some amount of, of, uh, management of a situation that you hadn't anticipated. I, th I think, you know, planning for the unexpected and, and expecting that to be part of your daily routine is, is really the best way to manage it so that you're not constantly, um, in a, in a panic mode or, or constantly trying to, uh, fight fires. It, it just has to become part of your daily routine. Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. And, and Mike, you mentioned agility, and I think another one of the buzzwords would be resilience. So, if you could both talk a little bit about, you know, some strategies maybe that your organizations are employing to build supply chain resilience uh, in the face of these disruptions, it's obviously very important to have a resilient supply chain to get through these things. So, how you know, how do you put that into play? Yeah, sure. I I would think that uh, one of the key things that we've done is, is diversifying our products, our educating our customers to make sure they're diversifying their supply chain. Uh, you know, some of the key words you hear out there nowadays are near shoring. That's one aspect of, of that diversification. 
but being able to make sure that um, as things come along like the pandemic or as things come along, uh, Jeff mentioned earlier, like the tariffs, you being able to be, be agile, as I said before, but being uh, educated in knowing what you can and what you can't do within your own supply chain. I think that's where most of our discussions go with our, our customers and in, in looking at some of the biggest disruptions and, and um, you know, following the pandemic, a lot of shippers saw the need to, to further diversify not only their sourcing, but um, looking at nearshoring, no, looking at different countries, looking at potentially different products and ports and modes. Uh, we, we work with our customers today in regards to um, some of them only using the ocean product. Today, they use the air product or they use consolidation methods. Uh, and it, it, it's, it's a different world and, and the customers are coming along and, and we spend most of our time uh, discussing, analyzing and educating. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll add on to that. I think um, for sure communication with the customer and, and, and really having them understand what their options are and what their options are not in a very honest way is, is, is one of the best approaches. Um, we, we often work with big companies that have a lot of their own specifications and in many cases, their supply chain drives our supply chain. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as a quick example, if I was to say, okay, well, Dow Chemical says you must use uh, rose mount temperature instruments. Okay, well, um, what are my options for getting those rose mount transmitters or, or, or temperature sensors? And can I uh, reliably say to, to that customer, yes, um, you know, I can, I can acquire those things. Or do I have to go back to them and tell them, yeah, we will try to do that if we can, but just realize there's some uncertainty in that. Do you have some flexibility here where we can possibly approach another supplier? Um, so for us, that that is a strategy and, and communicating with the customer is exactly, you know, what we need to do. Um, he, he mentioned nearshoring as well. And, and that's certainly, you know, another approach where we are proactively in, in many types of products that we buy looking for suppliers um, in the United States, in Mexico and Canada uh, to try and shorten those supply chains. Um, and then I, I think I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but just making a contractual allowances for that uncertainty so, so that you don't um, convey something that, that, that you can't achieve, I, I think is, is a, a really important thing um, to, to making sure you don't put yourself in a position where um, you, you literally can't can't achieve what, what you promise, not due to lack of effort, but just because it physically can't happen. Yeah, yeah, great insights there. Um, okay, I wanna switch a little bit. Let's talk uh, about technology. Obviously, uh, like all things uh, today, technology plays a big role. And I'm curious to know from both of you how you use technology to uh, mitigate and navigate through disruptions. Um, Mike, we keep picking on you first. So Jeff, do you want to start this one? Yeah, yeah, sure. I think, um, <clears throat> you know, for, for us, it's, it's kind of interesting. I mean, we're, we're clearly in a, in a B2B space. And, um, but what I think is interesting about it is that the, the business to consumer environment is really what drives our environment. And what we are finding is that most of our customers um, are, are starting to expect our business to behave much in the same way that a business to consumer, um, you know, platform would behave. Um, and whether that's, you know, having a web interface where you can quickly log in and, and check the status of your project or um, look at photographs or, um, you know, if, if it's um, I want to order parts or I want to uh, request field service, um, you know, what we're finding is, is and, and, you know, I'll kind of preface this by saying, if, if you just assume for a second that the products and services we have are, um, you know, good products, and, and that's not really a factor in, in competition um, amongst, uh, you know, our company and our competitors, um, the company that's best able to serve the customers in a way that they expect to be served is the company that's going to win. So, if, you know, if we can, for example, make buying spare parts or requesting uh, field service as easy as it is for somebody to go on, you know, Amazon and, and buy something and have it delivered to their house, then um, we feel like we will ultimately be uh, more successful. Um, I, I think it's just the expectation is that uh, for ease of access, um, you know, un unrestricted access to information 
and ease of, of, of achieving what you want, whether that be buying a product or, or, or requesting a service. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Mike, are you seeing similar uh, ideas? We are definitely. I, I I would say that technology has brought so much to the logistics field in regards to visibility, data integrity, uh, making sure that we're able to offer uh, different solutions to our customers. Uh, you know, with NCH Robinson, we we have our own in-house uh, technology as well as using third-party software, and, and we've we've come a very very long way. Uh, and, and, and we, we have an interface with our customers to where we can actually interact in real time to make changes on the fly. And in, it, as you speak about, uh, AI, I mean, that is, is we're just starting to understand what that can, can do to someone's, uh, supply chain and how it can help us. But take, for example, you know, we, we receive 11,000 quote requests a day for truckload alone, which is only one of our products. Uh, today, we answer those uh, quote requests within two two minutes and 13 seconds. And uh -huh. that's something that just never happened before. And not only is that happening, you take that AI and you, you see that it's actually making some of those mundane tasks that our people did not want to do, and it's making them uh, happen faster and making the data accurate uh as the data we receive so it's 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 come a long way we're just scratching the surface and it, it's exciting to see what the future holds and amy can i ask mike a quick question about that yeah of course so uh, mike i'm interested I, you know i've read a lot um, about blockchain and logistics um you know and that's not necessarily a new space and i'm just kind of curious from your perspective do you see blockchain actually showing up and in, in tracking and showing up in positive identification of materials and transactions what i would say about blockchain in particular is we're not seeing it on a broad basis uh, we are seeing within certain verticals as being necessary like pharmaceuticals um, but it's uh, from a broad based perspective across our business almost all of it is not a, re a requirement and we're not seeing much activity across our customer base. Yeah, interesting. And I'm glad you both brought up AI and blockchain. Um, obviously, those are technologies that have a lot of uh, potential going forward. But on the flip side, they also could be additional disruptions, you know, learning how to use these, how to apply them. Can you talk a little bit about that side? Is there a flip side of that coin where the you know technology acts not just as a solution, but also as a disruptor? And, and how do you deal with that? From my perspective, uh, technology can be a disruption in regards to not keeping up the pace with what is available today and what your customer expects. I think that's probably one of the biggest areas that we see as a disruptor. And that's, we spend a lot of time, not only working with our customers, but working with third parties to make sure that we're keeping up pace with technology and making sure that we stay out in front of it. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a challenge to, um, you don't you don't want to be the last one to adopt a technology. Um, you can certainly fall behind that way, and if you adopt too early, then you may have jumped on board with a technology that's not going to resonate and not actually move forward. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I mean, I would say from my perspective, you know, I think overall technology is a good thing. I think there's more good than bad. I, I'll give you one bad example. Um, that we've seen quite a bit of, and, and, and this has really been going on for the last several years, but it's gotten particularly bad recently, is uh, fraud. Um, and just um, the ability of people, especially with social media now and the kind of the integration with social uh, business and social media, like LinkedIn, for example, um, the ability of, of uh, bad actors to um, gather significant information about your company, your personnel, and use that to develop very, very well-planned, um, you know, I would call them deep fraud attempts mm -hmm. um, to, you know, extract money out of companies by, you know, posing as an accounting manager or posing as a vendor. Um, and, and if you combine that together with, you know, hacking emails and, and getting into accounts, it, it really, um, 
for us in particular, we've had a lot of challenges in the last year and, and it's actually gotten uh, to where we actually spend a significant amount of time in, in our AP and AR and have had to add a lot of processes to, to manage that so that we don't fall victim to it. Sure. And Mike, I would imagine your shippers are very concerned about that also. Uh, can you touch on that a bit for us? Sure. I, yeah, I, I they're worried about you know, the disruption, but they're worried about the next new thing coming down the road. And um, it's hard to predict uh, for sure. Um, and today you're starting to see layers of, of, of disruption. It's not one single event. Um, so I, I believe that it's a, a, it goes back to being flexible. It goes back to making sure that you're as educated as you possibly can around some of these disruptions. But I, I think that uh, ultimately uh, throughout those layers, making sure you're managing the entire supply chain from end to end to make sure that not one thing will affect something else in, in a negative way. And I, I think that that's uh, key as well. Okay, great. I want to touch on one other uh, disruption uh, in terms of sustainability, and it's not necessarily a disruption on its own, but similar to how we were saying with AI, uh, the emphasis placed on sustainability and getting to more sustainable business practices can be, you know, a disruption on on business as usual. Um, so, if you could touch on, uh, you know, whether you see that as, as as a type of disruption and how you are, you know, manage or managing through that, I would love to hear that from both of you. Yeah, I mean, I, I can start that one. I, I, for us, uh, we're an energy company. Um, we're in the energy space, and so sustainability is is it's it's an everyday part of what we do. Um, and you know, you you mentioned technology, and I, I think that you know kind of refers to AI and, and IT and and uh, the traditional tech space. But for us, technology is energy, right? And mm -hmm. and how that energy is produced, um, how it's transmitted, and how it's consumed. Um, and so we are, are very much um, always watching trends and sustainability and paying a lot of attention to development in the energy space, looking at where technology is going in that space, uh, because we have to respond to that in, in, in our products. Um, I think at the same time, we also have to, to, to be realistic and, and a bit agnostic with respect to where that technology is. I mean, we don't sell products unless customers buy those products. So, um, you know, as much as we might want a, a certain energy technology to be prevalent or, or for, you know, power plants or, um, you know, to adopt a certain type of technology or for a chemical plant to be more efficient, um, if they're not willing to buy that and willing to engage, then we can't sell it. Um, so we have to, to, to live in both worlds. We have to be um, aware, we have to be prepared, we have to continually develop our products and, and shift our products um, to be ready uh, for that sustainable future. At the same time, uh, we have to be um, conscious of what the market's demanding and, and be prepared to provide what that market requires. Uh, so it's a, it's a bit of a mix for us. Um, as much as we're aware uh, of you know, everything that's out there and all the technology that's available, um, we can only offer what what's being consumed. And, um, you know, I think obviously you're seeing that play out on a national stage right now. It's, it's very much um, it's very much a policy oriented direction and it's very much, a, a, you know, become politically uh, oriented uh, concept and a politically oriented um, thing to talk about where where you have, you know, uh, significant amounts of of. Um, uh, money being spent and lobbied on on varying views on what that should be, but but again, regardless, where it, wherever it ends up is is where we need to be. Right, right, sure. Well, and Mike, obviously, getting to greener supply chains and greener transportation is is huge on on your side of things. Can you handle or can you talk about how you handle that a little bit? Sure. Um, yeah, what Jeff mentions is is similar to what we hear from from most of our customer base. I mean, sustainability is no longer a nice to have it's a business necessity um, and it's it, and jeff touched on it a little bit there but it's important you know for companies to understand their supply chain emissions uh at the very least mm -hmm. there is going to be disruption from non-compliance uh as you know mainly due to increasing regulations across the world and and, and that's only going to continue and 
and uh, we we as an organization help our customers identify identify their goals uh, making sure that they're in compliance uh, and bring those solutions forward yeah makes sense okay so let's close out with a little uh future looking uh i would ask both of you what do you think is the next disruption coming around the bend uh and how are you preparing for it now I'll uh, jump to this one real quick. Uh, so what I would say is uh, we can't predict most of the disruptions. We wouldn't have seen COVID. We wouldn't have seen uh, some of the weather events that created some of the, the issues. Uh, there are some that we, that we can prepare for like a strike or, or, or things of that nature. But um, it's really about ultimately managing through the different layers of disruption um, we are looking uh, in the short term, we're looking at the strike uh, that was delayed into January. So we are preparing for that. We're working with our customers. We're making sure that they have uh, solutions that are diverse um, and, and actually can, can react in, time, in real time to make sure that there's uh, the least amount of effect of, of those disruptions. So that's probably the one that's top of mind uh, is that one. Uh, but we're prepared at all times. As we know, disruption is is something that's going to continue. Uh, and the pace of that disruption is is actually uh, becoming faster and faster. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, for sure, the, the there are broad disruptive trends that I think are, are a little easier to see and, and a little bit easier to react to. Um, you know, just one quick example on the positive side, there, there's been or at least positive side for us. Um, there's been a broad trend towards uh, rebuilding manufacturing in the US. That's not and it's not that's not really, um, you know, that's I'd say that's fairly politically neutral. Um, it, it's been nice to see uh, really most of the country get behind the idea that we should build more things here. And uh, for, for us, for a company like us that supplies equipment to uh, people to build things, that's that's a good thing. Um, and so that that's a disruption that we we hope will continue, you know, over time. Um, you know, as far as more immediate things, I, I think Mike's right. It's really hard to to just know in advance what's going to happen, um, other than just to, to to expect that you're going to be surprised in any given week with what pops up. I mean, of, of course, you could point out the election as probably the most immediate thing that's going to happen, and you have um, you know fairly significant difference in, in the direction that each party wants to go. And so as a business, I think you just have to be prepared, prepared for both. I think you have to be prepared to um, react to, you know, any, any kind of change in trade policy, any kind of change in tariffs, any kind of changes in, um, you know, you know, corporate taxes that, that may impact, for example, capital investment um, for people who buy capital equipment like ours. So, um, I, I think all of those things have the potential to to, to dis disrupt the world in the very near future, and um, we can certainly plan for both sides of, of those things. But but I don't know if that really qualifies as a disruption if you can plan for it well in advance. So I think Mike's right. I think it's hard to see hard to see for sure. I I, I, I will promise you one thing: between now and and let's say you know next next March or April, I'm sure there will be something that we didn't discuss today that happened that we had to react to. So <laughs> there's no, uh, sorry about that, Jeff. I, uh, I don't know how the heck I overlooked the election that uh, yeah. probably should have been, uh, it's coming. <laughs> it's coming for sure. Yeah. Well, be, be prepared to be unprepared seems to be the takeaway, uh, or be prepared for anything I should say in a more positive way. Uh, simple concept, very hard to execute. Uh, obviously this is a, you know, key topic that is of ongoing interest to our audience. So I thank you both, uh, Mike and Jeff for your great insights today. Thanks for, for, uh, joining us. Thank you very much. Yeah, it was nice to talk to you, Mike, and appreciate, Amy, you having us on. Inbound Logistics Magazine is the information leader in supply chain and logistics management. Start your free print and digital subscription today by visiting bit.ly slash getil. That's bit.ly slash get underscore il and stay ahead of the 3PL game.
The Inbound Logistics Podcast is a production of Inbound Logistics Magazine. For the most in-depth information around logistics, transportation, and supply chain practices, get your free print and digital subscription at inboundlogistics.com slash subscribe. Connect with us via LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube for the most current developments in the industry. If you'd like to leave us some feedback or have a topic you'd like to see covered in a future episode, call our dialogue line at 888-878-3247 or leave us an email at podcast at inboundlogistics.com. I'm your host, Jeff Vita. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you next time here on the Inbound Logistics Podcast.